Our scripture lesson for this morning comes to us from Acts chapter 10, verses 34 through 48. Hear now what the Spirit is saying to the church. Then Peter began to speak to them. I truly understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. You know the message he sent to the people of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. That message spread throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John announced, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are witnesses to all that he did both in Judea and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him on the third day and allowed him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who were chosen by God as witnesses and who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one ordained by God as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. While Peter was still speaking, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who heard the word. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astounded that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles, for they they heard them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter said, Can anyone withhold the water of baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? So he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they invited him to stay for several days. This is the word of the Lord. So uh, I don't know if you guys knew this, and I'm, I'm sorry to break it to you if you didn't know by now, but it's the year 2020. That came out of nowhere. I don't know about you. It surprised me. And um, I hate to remind you of this as well, but that means that this is a presidential election year, which means that I am sure we are in for what will be a year of quiet civility, well-reasoned and thoughtful dialogue, and a concerted push for acceptance and unity. Oh, right. I forgot. We talk a lot about tribalism these days. We blame tribalism as the root of our political issues. Tribalism is what makes us so nasty to each other. There's impeachment. It's an election year. Passions are high. Tribalism has been on my mind. I think Danny mentioned a while back that whereas people used to not marry each other because of their different religious beliefs, now we are so divided that we won't marry someone outside of our political parties. I read in an article recently that talked about um, how people have been re-watching the television series The West Wing as a quasi-religious experience to remember what it was to believe in the possibility that people on different sides of political issues could be well-intentioned and have the best interest of the country at heart. The article reads, Much as people may return to the film, it's a wonderful life to remind themselves that feeling worthless does not mean you do not have worth. Or to the children's book, Good Night Moon, to remember that bedtime once meant being enveloped in a cocoon of love, fans revisit the West Wing to recall an era, even a fictional one, when it seemed possible for the three branches of government to be populated by public servants of integrity, intellect, and wit. The article interviews several Republicans and Democrats who enjoy the show because both parties are portrayed honorably despite their differences. Those were the days. Which is why when I came across the lectionary text in Acts for this morning, I got excited. I truly understand God shows no partiality, St. Peter says. I thought, this is great. I can write one of those, can't we all just get along sermons. I've preached those before. I could preach that we ought not to worry about who's a Democrat and who's a Republican or who likes Trump or who misses Barack and that God doesn't pick favorites. I could pull Peter's line that God shows no partiality and run with it. I'm tempted to say in this election year 
that we ought to remember that there are Christians who are Democrats and Christians who are Republicans, and this is a purple church, and you like apples, and I like oranges, but hey, we're all eating fruit, so let's just sing kumbaya because God shows no partiality, right? I'm tempted to look at this text and say that what it's trying to teach us is that there are good people on both sides. But as much as I wish I could channel my Midwestern agreeableness and say, gee shucks, can't we all just get along? I cannot in good conscience use this text to say that. That's an oversimplification that will not do. Uh Uh-oh. The warning lights are flashing. They have those in the pulpits now, you know. Rule number one, no politics in church, Nate. The residency committee is sweating. Nate's in the last quarter of his residency. He's a loose cannon. Cut the mic. Don't you preach to me up there. The truth is, God does show partiality. What on earth is St. Peter talking about? If God does anything, it's show partiality. From the beginnings of scripture, God shows partiality. God chooses Noah and his family to survive a flood and destroys everyone and everything else. God chooses Abraham and makes him a great nation, unique in all the world. God chooses Moses and the Israelites over the Egyptians. God chooses the Israelites over the Philistines. God chooses David over Saul. God chooses to love the captive over the Babylonians. And as we just remembered a few short weeks ago, God chooses a young, poor, peasant girl named Mary to bear God's self into the world. And that word made flesh shows partiality again and again and again. When Jesus gets up to preach, he does not say, Verily I say unto you, you do you. No. Christ says, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you will be hungry. Woe to you who are laughing now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when all speak well of you, for that is what their ancestors did to false prophets. I don't know about you, but that doesn't sound too impartial to me. It sounds like God is taking sides all the time. So what's the deal? Is God impartial or not? And what does that mean for us? Let's roll back the tape in our story. How did Peter, an observant Jew, get connected to Cornelius, a centurion of the Italian cohort? Who was this Cornelius guy? We don't know much, but in the beginning of chapter 10, we find out the character of this man. This Gentile officer in the Roman army was someone who feared God with all his household, and he gave alms generously to the people and prayed constantly to God. In case you need a Sunday school refresher, Peter and the disciples were all Jewish. They did not associate with Gentiles like Cornelius. One day, in a vision, an angel comes to Cornelius and says that his prayers and the fact that he's been giving to the poor have caught God's attention and that he is to meet Simon Peter, someone who he's never heard of before. By the time they meet, God has already prepped Peter to change his thinking about Gentiles. As Peter puts it to Cornelius and his followers, you yourself know that it is unlawful for a Jew to associate with or visit a Gentile, but God has shown me that I should not call anyone profane or unclean. Which brings us back to today's text. And Peter says, I truly understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. There it is. It's the second part that makes sense of it all. There's a qualifier. God is impartially partial, so to speak. Anyone who fears God and does what is right, those are who are acceptable to God. Our story for today should never have happened. It's crazy. There is no reason in the world that a Roman soldier and a devout Jew should join together in a common mission. They were to be sworn enemies. A Roman soldier falls at the feet of a Jewish peasant. A devout Jew breaks bread with a Gentile. 
This should not happen. But because they both feared God and did what was right, God worked in them. That's a huge takeaway for us. We would do well to remember that God can and God will work with anyone at any time in any place where there are people who fear him and do what is right. We ought not presume to know for certain who those people are. We might, just like Peter, be surprised. But do not think for a second that God is not asking something new of us or something more of us than who we already are. We cannot stay true to our old allegiances and expect God to do a new thing. Peter and Cornelius both had to change. As Will Willimon puts it, Gentiles like Cornelius are included not as those who are basically nice people, but those who, like Israel, are able to repent. It only becomes possible when they repent and take on a new identity, those who fear and follow God. Both of them have to jettison their old identity. Peter cannot cling to the rigidity of his old understanding of the law, of who is in and who is out. And Cornelius cannot continue to think that Caesar is Lord when he knows that Christ is now the true Lord of his life. They cannot use any of their old identifiers because the truth is God shows no partiality to those old identifiers. What God does not show partiality for and what Peter was talking about is that God shows no partiality to race or nationality. God doesn't love Gentiles any less than God loves Jewish people. And God doesn't love any of God's other children any less than any other. God doesn't love white people or black people or Latino people or Asian people or indigenous people or gay people or straight people or disabled folks or able folks any more or less than any of God's other children. God does not distinguish between American body counts and Iranian body counts and Iraqi body counts. God does not show partiality in that way. Those who fear God and do what is right are acceptable to him. Full stop. That's the gospel on the move. That's the grace of God that cannot be contained. Which brings us back to us. How do we know whose side God is on? Who is God partial to? What about the election? You know, I I did a quick search of my Greek New Testament, and it turns out that the words Republican and Democrat are used only three times each. I'm just kidding. They're not used at all. They don't show up there. Here's the deal. I think the minute we start using Democrat or Republican or even American as our primary identifiers, we've already lost the gospel. We've already taken our eye off the ball. No, no longer can we think of ourselves as Republican or Democrat or Independent as our top identifiers. If we think of ourselves as conservative or liberal or even a Tar Heel or a Blue Devil or a Southerner or American or any other identifier before or as importantly as we think of ourselves as followers of Christ, that's a problem. That's something we need to examine. Our story today ends with baptism, the baptism of Cornelius and many other Gentiles. They put aside their old identifiers and realize now that they are part of a new tribe. And we are part of this new tribe too. As Paul puts it, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Jesus Christ. It's an election year. We will be tempted to fall into our old tribes and claim that God is on our side. Lest we forget there is only one tribe that matters. That's the tribe of our baptism. That's the tribe that does justice, loves mercy, and walks humbly with our God. That's the tribe that loves God with all our heart and all our soul and all our mind and loves our neighbor as ourselves. That's the tribe that strives to love our enemy. That's the tribe that cares for the widow and the orphan and the foreigner and the vulnerable. That's the tribe that stewards creation. That's the tribe that dies to oneself for the well-being of another. That's the only identity that matters for us. As far as our politics can help advance those concerns, that's fine and good. 
you should use your votes to advance those aims as faithfully as you can. Do not set aside your Christian values at the ballot box. But make no mistake, that's not where our true hope lies. As Will Willimon puts it, to be a Christian is to exchange allegiance to answer to the summons of a different emperor to transfer citizenship to a new world. We have a new identity. And I think that if we start trying to live out those qualifications that Peter has for us, the rest will sort itself out. Do we truly love and fear God? The God that flips over tables in the temple and loves us enough to die on a cross for us should make us tremble. Do we try to do what is right in everything we do? Do we use our faith in Christ as the measure of what right is? With all the noise we'll hear this election year, may we not look to the world for answers, but remember we serve a different master. Do not be so sure whose side God is on. And as for you, fear God and know that the God you fear loves you fiercely. Do what is right. Let Christ be your guide. Remember your baptism. Amen.